So I just want to thank everybody for coming to our Lunch and Learn series today. This series is always the second Tuesday of every month. And so this is the last, second to last speaker in 2020. And we've been doing this virtually since March and the attendance is better than ever. And it's a really <laughs> successful model. So even if when things go back to in-person operations, I have a feeling we will continue in this format at least to continue to allow a broader audience to attend. Today, we have Dr. Katherine Bangan from uh, the Department of Psychiatry uh, speaking today about the role of vascular health in mild cognitive impairment and dementia. So she's going to um, review some of the research that she's had underway and talk a little bit about some of the um, arterial stiffness measures that we've been gathering on our longitudinal study participant cohort um, at the ADRC to assist her in some of her data collection in some of her projects, um, but otherwise talk a lot about the work that she's been doing. So thank you so much. Um, the way the, these are formatted is she'll present. And if you have questions, there will be time at the end for question and answer. You can insert questions throughout in the chat and we can go through those systematically. And if it occurs to you at the end, you're welcome to just speak up and ask questions at the end of the presentation as well. All right, thanks so much. Okay, well, thank you for having me and thank you for the introduction, Christina. So I'll go ahead and try to share my screen. Um, Let's see. And can everyone see that okay? Yeah? Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I know this is a figure people have seen, you know, many, many times showing the current model of Alzheimer's disease. I think every time I go to an Alzheimer's disease conference, this is the you know, most um, shown slide. Um, but we have um, in this figure, it's showing biomarkers going from normal to abnormal, you know, as a function of clinical disease stage, going from cognitively normal to MCI, you know, to dementia on the x-axis. And in this figure, you can see that the earliest proposed changes are in amyloid, which is shown there in red. So it's thought that amyloid is the first Thing that changes. Um, then we have tau in blue, um, brain structure in green, memory in purple, and then finally, you know, clinical function there at the end. So, you know, what's important to note though is that vascular pathology um, is often mixed with Alzheimer's pathology and aging and mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. And this really isn't taken, you know, into account um, in that, that model. Um, that I just showed. So this is work from Julie Schneider and colleagues at Rush in Chicago, where they looked at participants who either had normal cognition, um, mild cognitive impairment, or probable Alzheimer's disease um, before death. And then they looked at the underlying neuropathology at autopsy. So this um, pie chart here is showing individuals who were deemed to be cognitively normal, so no cognitive impairment. And what they found was that primary, the primary pathology, most common pathology was vascular only. So that's that, that pink wedge there at the top. Then when they looked at individuals who had been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, um, they found that vascular only, so again, that pink wedge, um, AD plus vascular and AD plus vascular plus other. So kind of those two um, blue wedges, large blue wedges there at the bottom, those were the most common um, you know, forms of underlying neuropathology. And only 7.8% of the MCI group had pure Alzheimer's disease. Then when they looked at individuals who had probable Alzheimer's disease diagnosis before death, they found that the Alzheimer's disease plus vascular plus other was most common. So that large um, kind of bright blue um, wedge there at the bottom. So really remarkably, only 3% of these participants you know, with probable Alzheimer's disease. And this is work um, 
from the Rush group, from another one of their cohorts. Um, and I was involved with this study as was Lisa, Lisa Delina Wood here at UCSD. And what we looked at was we looked at combined um, neuropathological pathways and how they kind of for age-related risk of dementia. And there are multiple um, biostaticians on this project and they looked at all kinds of um, you know, complex models and use structural equation modeling. And this figure um, here just shows you know, one of the models that we examined and I won't go into too much detail about the statistics. Kind of the take home point from the study was that vascular pathology accounted for about a third of the association of age and dementia. And the remaining pathways um, and the ones that we looked at were Alzheimer's disease, Lewy bodies and uh, TDP43 or hippocampus sclerosis accounted for 68% um, of the association of age and dementia. So again, just showing um, you know, how common um, you know, vascular disease is and how um, critical it is um, in, in dementia risk. So this uh, study is also from uh, the Rush group. And here they looked at the probability of Alzheimer's disease dementia as a function of Alzheimer's disease um, pathology. And this is a, a summary measure that they looked at. And these different lines um, here just represent uh, different um, forms of vascular pathology. So in purple at the bottom there, those were individuals who had no vascular pathology, or at least not the forms that um, you know, were examined. And then with each of those other lines, as we go higher up, um, these are additional forms of vascular um, pathology until we get to that top blue line where these individuals had all forms of vascular pathology that they looked at in the study. So this was um, you know, gross infarcts, microinfarcts, um, atherosclerosis, and arteriosclerosis. So we can see um, you know, here that at a given level of Alzheimer's disease pathology, so here we're looking at you know, relatively um, you know, low level of pathology, but um, if individuals had no uh, vascular pathology, they had about a 25% a so or chance of Alzheimer's disease dementia. But if you know, an individual with that same level of Alzheimer's disease pathology had you know, all the vascular um, pathologies that were, that were looked at, then their risk of dementia would go up to over 60%. So this suggests that cerebrovascular disease increases the odds of dementia at each level of Alzheimer's disease pathology, or in other words, we can think about um, vascular disease lowering the threshold for dementia. So we looked at something uh, similar in our local ADRC sample. And in this study, um, we looked at individuals who had autopsy confirmed Alzheimer's disease. So everyone in the sample had been diagnosed clinically before death and then um, confirmed on autopsy that they had Alzheimer's disease. And we actually excluded individuals who had you know, large uh, stroke. So we looked at people who did have more mild forms of cerebrovascular disease. Um, we had a group that had Alzheimer's disease with some cerebrovascular changes, and then also a kind of pure Alzheimer's um, disease group that didn't have vascular or other um, forms of neuropathology. So the two groups, so the AD with vascular change group and the peer AD group um, had similar levels of cognitive impairment. So they didn't differ in terms of um, dementia rating scale score or, or other, um, other measures. But the Alzheimer's disease with cerebrovascular change um, group, they had less severe Alzheimer's disease pathology or lower um, Brock stage, so fewer uh, neurofibrillary tangles. And here, this is just showing the AD with vascular change group. And you can see there's a you know, large um, you know, section of that pie that's in gray. So they had this lower Brock stage compared to the black, which were their higher Brock stage or um, you know, more uh, neurofibrillary tangles. And we looked at the Alzheimer's disease um, without vascular change, so this pure AD group, they had um, many more individuals in, you know, with that higher, higher Brock stage. So these findings um, suggested to us that vascular pathology you know, influences clinical expression of Alzheimer's disease. And even in patients with autopsy confirmed AD, and even those with relatively mild cerebrovascular changes, because again, we excluded individuals you know, who, had, um, who had large strokes. So I presented um, that kind of 
prevailing model that, that figure that, that first slide I showed with the different um, curves of um, biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease. Um, but there are other you know, models of Alzheimer's disease and this two hit vascular hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease proposed by Zlokovich has been around for a while now for you know, about um, 10 years ago, he wrote this paper um, in Nature Reviews Neuroscience. And in this model, um, you know, he suggests that vascular factors, so hypertension, diabetes, um, cardiac disease, this leads to blood brain barrier dysfunction and reduced blood flow. So that's this hit one, this first hit. Um, and then that downstream leads to, um, leads to amyloid accumulation, to um, tau accumulation, um, regeneration, and eventually cognitive decline. So importantly, you know, there's these vascular biomarker methods. Um, and then the kind of the current Alzheimer's is these biomarker methods, which focus a lot on amyloid and tau, which, you know, in this model would be downstream, which would be later changes than these vascular changes. So really features associated with HIT-1 of this model, um, you know, would lead to earlier therapeutic opportunities than maybe currently um, available. Um, in you know, most studies that have been focusing trials on amyloid in particular. So we've been looking at um, you know, different uh, vascular markers and Christina did allude to um, the arterial stiffness um, data that we've been collecting at the ADRC, which I'll, which I'll discuss in those um, preliminary results that we've been working on. Um, but we've been you know, interested in several different uh, vascular markers, um, but our still stif arterial stiffness is um, one of the main ones. And so arterial stiffening does increase in aging. It also increases with conditions like hypertension and it may be an independent risk factor for um, pathological brain aging. So it leads to damage to microvasculature um, and you know, reduced blood flow and um, potential ischemia. So we've looked at um, a couple of different ways that we can measure arterial stiffening. So one is pulse pressure. So elevated pulse pressure, and I should say pulse pressure is um, you know, just calculated as systolic blood pressure minus diastolic blood pressure. And it's really a surrogate marker of, of arterial stiffening. And so with aging, you know, systolic blood pressure increases, um, whereas diastolic blood pressure decreases. So we can see that you know, pulse pressure then, um, the difference of these two you know, will widen um, and will increase. And this cartoon just shows an example of you know, an elastic um, vessel, and then you have a stiff vessel there on the right. Um, so we can see with this elastic vessel, um, you know, during systole, you know, when the, the heart is um, contracting, that these vessels, um, when there's increased pressure and flow, they actually can dilate or expand. And then in diastole, you know, in between um, the heartbeats, then um, the vessels actually can recoil. Um, whereas if you have a stiff vessel, that, you know, that won't be happening and you're not getting that um, expansion um, and recoiling. So on the right here, we can see that um, you know, during systole, if you're not having that compliant vessel, if it's not expanding, if it's stiff, um, you'll be getting an increase in pressure there. Um, whereas in diastole, if it's not recoiling, you can actually you know, see, see a decrease there. So we looked at elevated pulse pressure um, in a few different studies and linked it to cognitive decline and also different Alzheimer's disease biomarkers. And a lot of this work um, was led by uh, Dan Nation, who was a postdoc here, worked with Mark Bondi um, in our lab and is now at UC Irvine. And functional decline, um, we've also looked at that. Um, progression to dementia, Alzheimer's disease biomarkers, both with CSF and with um, PET imaging and cerebral atrophy. And so I'll show an example of um, a couple of these different results from some of these previous studies. So this was, um, uh, this was a study actually in ADNI, so the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative that was led um, by Dan Nation. And here he looked at pulse pressure um, relating to progression to dementia. So there was a low pulse pressure group, which you can see um, in black, and then a high pulse pressure group which is shown there in orange. Um, and you can see um, when we're looking at time, time to dementia diagnosis that so that group in orange is, is um, you know, having a faster, faster progression there. 
so in this study, um, again, it, this was an ADNI, um, we also looked at higher pulse pressure in relation to CSF biomarkers of amyloid and tau. And in this project, um, Dan, you know, divided the sample into a young old group and then a very old group. And then within each of these age groups, we, um, we also um, looked at different biomarker profiles. And this was based on whether people are amyloid and um, P tau positive or negative. So there are four different biomarker groups within each of these age groups. And what we found was individuals who were P tau positive show elevated pulse pressure regardless of age. So within each of these age groups, those are the two groups on the right. So these darker bars where you see the A and B, and then also um, on the right in the very old group too, those two darker, taller bars. And then in the very old participants, there was a further increase in pulse pressure seen in those who are both P tau and amyloid positive. So that's in C there, so you can see that tall bar there. So this was a study by Alex Wiegand, who's a graduate student working with Mark Bondi. And this was data that Alex presented at AIC um, for the remote conference this year. And so, you know, what, we, what I just showed was looking at CSF. Um, so not, um, you know, a marker within the brain, although of course CSF does, you know, relate to um, you know, brain, um, amyloid and tau, but we also want to look at actual brain imaging. So this is looking at tau PET. Um, and so what Alex um, found was that higher pulse pressure predicted increased tau PET accumulation over 12 months. And this was for all three regions of interest that she looked at. So she looked at um, adrenal cortex, uh, inferior temporal gyrus, and inferior parietal lobe. And in this study, um, she also did adjust for age, sex, cognitive diagnosis. So all these people were without dementia, but she adjusted for whether they were cognitively normal versus um, having mild cognitive impairment. Um, also APOE4 status and baseline um, tau PET signal as well. So Christina did mention, you know, the, the pulse wave velocity, kind of arterial stiffening that we've been collecting at the ADRC. And this is um, using carotid femoral um, pulse wave velocity um, with the signal core machine, which some of you may have, you know, seen this device. But this is a more, you know, direct measure of arterial stiffening versus pulse pressure, um, which really is more of a surrogate marker. So just briefly, um, for those who may not be familiar with how um, the sphygma core and how these measurements work is um, carotid pulse is measured using a tonometer device. Um, you know, it's held on the neck and then femoral pulse is measured with a blood pressure um, cuff that's uh, on the thigh. And the pulse transit time is a time interval between the onset of the carotid and femoral um, pulse wave upstroke and the pulse wave travel distance, so the distance between the carotid and femoral um, pulse wave recording points are actually measured um, over the body just with, with a tape measure. And then the carotid femoral pulse wave velocity is calculated as the distance divided, divided by the pulse transit time. So you get um, the value in meters per second and higher carotid femoral pulse wave velocity indicates a stiffer, um, stiffer aorta. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some preliminary results we have from a project that I've been working on and working on very closely with Dennis Mironoff and, and um, Drs. Glasgow and Salmon and many others have been involved, um, Christina and um, you know, some of the study coordinators and others with collecting this data, which has been um, very tedious, uh, but I think we're, we're getting some really, really interesting um, findings. So you know, as we, um, as I just talked about a little bit in summarizing some of the previous studies, you know, much of the previous work that we've done here is focused on pulse pressure as a surrogate marker and not, you know, pulse wave velocity, which you know, is a more direct measure. And we also haven't really looked, um, you know, in our, in our samples, how arterial stiffening may interact with Alzheimer's disease risk factors to affect cognition. So we wanted to investigate um, the synergistic effects of Alzheimer's disease risk factors. And we focused on um, APOE4 genotypes, so genetic risk um, for Alzheimer's disease, and then also AD biomarker um, positivity based on CSF. Um, so we want to look at the interaction of those risk factors um, with uh, elevated pulse wave velocity on cognitive functioning. 
So this is the um, ADRC um, sample that we've been working with um, who have this data available. So um, there's 168 cognitive normal participants and 26 um, with MCI. You can see here the breakdown in demographics. Um, and it's, it's really a healthy you know, sample in terms of vascular risk. So the Framingham stroke risk profile, which um, gives you the 10 year probability of having a stroke is 9.9 you know, uh, .9 in the cognitively normal group and 13.1 in the MCI group. Also um, the pulse wave velocity um, values are you know, relatively low. Um, often people will use a value of, of 12 meters per second to indicate um, you know, elevated pulse rate velocity or arterial stiffening. And you can see here the means in these groups are 8.8 .8 and 9.9. .9. So you know, overall, and we know that about our ADRC sample, it's you know, in terms of um, you know, vascular risk factors, it's a you know, relatively healthy sample. So this, um, these graphs here, um, which Dennis provided, um, these show different cognitive domain Z scores um, based on composites that he calculated and its associations with pulse wave velocity. And this is across the entire sample. Um, and we have the cognitively normal um, participants you can see in blue. And again, this is the sample really is predominantly normal. There's not very many with um, MCI. Um, and the MCI group in, in red there, the red dots. Um, and so across the sample, um, we only saw significant association with pulse wave velocity for executive functioning. Um, so you can see that that's the second um, graph there. And the other domains um, actually were not, were not significant across the whole sample. So we didn't, weren't relating to pulse wave velocity. And these models did adjust for age, um, sex, and education. Then when we looked at the interactions of pulse wave velocity and AD um, risk factors, this, these graphs are looking at um, Apple E4. And so we have E4 carriers in red and um, non-carriers in blue. And we saw an interaction for the memory domain only, not the other cognitive domains. So that first um, panel there. Um, so you can see there in red, those E4 carriers, you can see that association with you know, poor cognition and um, and a higher uh, pulse wave velocity. And there's a similar um, findings when instead of looking at Apple E4, when we looked at um, CSF biomarkers, so this is whether people were positive, um, which are shown in red, or negative, um, which are shown in blue based on a tau um, A beta ratio. And so again, it was just for, just for the memory domain where we saw the significant um, interaction where pulse wave velocity was associated with poor cognition in um, the AD um, biomarker positive group. So, those results that I showed, you know, when we look at pulse wave velocity and, you know, pulse pressure, um, we are finding really, um, you know, interesting results, but we also want to know, you know, about what's happening, you know, within the brain as well, um, you know, instead of just, you know, peripheral markers. Um, so there's, you know, several different lesions that can lead to cognitive um, impairment, you know, in terms of cerevascular lesions. So obviously strokes, if um, people have, you know, a large stroke or even, the strategic um, infarct in a subcortical region. Um, people have multiple infarcts or um, even white matter lesions. So, um, which is thought to be an MRI marker of small vessel cerebrovascular disease and something that you know, I've been really, um, really interested in. So this also is just showing some of the different types of vascular lesions, um, you know, affecting the brain. So really, you know, vascular disease is, you know, very heterogeneous. There's, you know, many different forms, um, but some examples, um, cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Um, so when you have, you know, amyloid within the vessel that can lead to microbleeds and we, um, you know, can capture that on MRI and we are collecting um, susceptibility weighted imaging, you know, to, to quantify those and, and to look at that. Um, also um, small vessel occlusions or you know, blockages um, that lead to reduced blood flow um, can lead to micro, micro infarcts um, and, and so on. So just a, you know, a few examples there. Also um, this figure here is just showing the cerebral um, blood supply and you can see that you know, around the surface of the brain, um, the more vasculature and you know, we have these watershed regions, so subcortical regions and white matter where there are um, you know, fewer vessels supplying these, these regions. That's why they may be more susceptible to, um, to vascular disease. 
So white matter hyperintensity. So I just um, mentioned that, but again, this is um, not thought to be small vessel cerebrovascular disease as seen on um, MRI, usually on um, T2 weighted flare scans. Um, so fluid attenuated inversion recovery scans, we used to look at these. And we often um, will also divide them into you know, different types. Um, we've looked sometimes at you know, low bar or regional white matter hyperintensity volume. And also a common way to separate these is they're into periventricular hyperintensities. So these are you know, just right along um, the ventricles. And these are really um, you know, very common you know, in, in normal aging. Um, and you know, there's some debates about um, you know, how well white matter hyperintensities can map onto cognition. But some of the results we've seen here from studies by Lisa you know, Delaney Wood and Mark Bondi is that the periventricular hyperintensities may not affect cognition, you know, as much as, you know, kind of these deep white matter hyperintensities, um, kind of these subcortical hyper, hyperintensities that are not, you know, kind of lining the ventricles. And there's been work by um, Adam Brickman, who's at Columbia, um, who's done a lot of work in white matter um, hyperintensities and proposes that it actually is a core feature of Alzheimer's um, disease. And some of um, you know, their evidence for arguing this is they've looked in uh, the Diane cohort, so in um, autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, and they found that um, in mutation carriers, so this graph here is showing um, total white matter hyperintensity volume by estimated year from symptom onset. So uh, the mutation carriers are shown in red there, and then the non-carriers um, are in blue. And they calculate um, this estimated year from onset as the participant's age uh, minus uh, the parental age of onset. And so you can see though that um, the, in the mutation carriers, there is this increase in white matter hyperintensities, you know, years before the expected symptom onset. So you can see there in red, you know, these white matter hyperintensities um, increasing. And, um, you know, given this, this is part of um, why Adam um, Brookman has argued that this really might be a, you know, core feature of Alzheimer's disease and a potential therapeutic target and something, you know, that we should be considering, um, you know, in our studies. So we've looked um, also in the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative at um, white matter hypertensities and um, looked at different uh, low bar um, white matter hypertensity volumes instead of just looking at total, um, which is often done in studies or the um, deep versus periventricular. So here we looked at frontal, um, temporal, parietal, and occipital. Um, and this is showing um, the cognitively normal group in gray, amnestic MCI is in green, and the non-amnestic MCI in blue. And so we, with the amnestic MCI group, they showed um, higher temporal and occipital white matter hyperintensity volume compared to that cognitively normal group. So you can see those circled there. Um, and it doesn't look like a huge difference, but that is, is significant. And then in the non-amnestic MCI group, so this group, um, they did have impairment in you know, multiple non-memory dom domains, so executive functioning, um, visual spatial abilities, and they showed more widespread um, white matter hypertensity accumulation affecting all four lobes when we would compare them to, um, to that cognitively normal group in gray. So, you know, white matter hyperintensities, um, you know, are thought to be irreversible. You know, there's lesions um, at that point um, and permanent damage. Although um, at AAIC this year, there was um, a talk um, by uh, Dr. Wardlaw where she um, has shown that in um, treating stroke patients, they actually did see some um, reversal of white matter hyperintensities, which I thought was really, really interesting. Because again, we usually think of that as a permanent change, um, but they show that might not be the case, that it might be, um, you know, inflammation and some processes that over time then do become, you know, permanent lesions. But if people are treated, that might not be the case. So I thought that was really um, kind of an intriguing, um, intriguing data she showed. Um, but, but in general, you know, we do think of, you know, by the time people have white matter hyperintensities, they have these um, irreversible lesions. So we do want to look at markers um, that are, 
you know, even earlier markers. So we're really interested in looking at um, cerebral blood flow. So we measure this, you know, um, non-invasively using arterial spin labeling um, MRI um, and our UCSD Center for fMRI um, and Tom Liu, who's a director there, actually are at the forefront of ASL techniques. Um, so we're really, you know, fortunate to have them here. And we've been collecting, um, you know, this ASL data for, for many years now. Um, and more recently, um, we've also looked um, in, in ADNI um, again, and we found that um, lower baseline CBF, and this was in medial temporal um, lobe regions, um, it did predict faster decline across cognitive domains, so in memory and executive functioning and language. And the low CBF group here, you know, is, is shown here in green. Um, and people were followed um, for, for five years um, in this study. And this was, um, you know, after adjusting for demographics, um, APOE4 positivity, CSF um, P tau uh, A beta ratio, um, neuronal metabolism. And so we, we adjusted for a lot of um, important Alzheimer's disease risk factors. And we um, adjust for metabolism in part because with cerebral blood flow, um, you know, if there was a reduction um, that could relate to, you know, vascular factors or also, you know, reduce metabolism potentially. So we want to try to, you know, disentangle that the best we can. And so hence, that's why in this um, study, we're able to um, adjust for metabolism, which is, which is helpful. Um, because CBF reductions are often, you know, attributed to, to um, reduced neuronal metabolism. And here, you know, it seemed like maybe it is, um, you know, more vascular. In this same study, we looked at um, CBF as a predictor of neurodegeneration. So um, this is entorhinal thickness there on the left. Um, so again, that the low CBF group at baseline is in green, the high CBF group is in orange. So you can see that green group um, is having more um, or a faster rate of enrhinal thinning. And they also, this low CBF group showed um, faster accumulation of white matter hyperintensities. Um, there on the right, you can see that in green. So, and again, um, we adjusted for the, the same, um, you know, covariates that I just mentioned. So um, demographics, APOE4 positivity, um, CSF, AD biomarkers, and neuronal metabolism. So I think there's, you know, a growing appreciation of vascular contributions, you know, to Alzheimer's disease and the importance of um, considering vascular factors when we're studying Alzheimer's disease. And another thing um, that's been in, of interest, um, you know, to me and to many others is, um, you know, focusing on uh, middle age. Because there's a lot of evidence that vascular factors, so hypertension, you know, diabetes, and especially in midlife, um, you know, are important risk factors for dementia. Um, and this is, you know, from one study from um, Rebecca Gottsman's group where they found that midlife smoking, diabetes, prehypertension, and hypertension um, are all associated with increased, you know, risk of dementia in late life. Um, and interestingly, I think the hazard ratio um, for dementia for diabetes was almost as high as that for APOE4 genotype, which we know is an important risk factor. So midlife, um, you know, seems to be a very important time. And part of this, you know, may relate to, you know, chronicity, duration of disease is important. The longer someone has, um, you know, diabetes or hypertension, the longer that, you know, um, pathology can be um, accumulating. And um, no, you know, vascular factors are potentially modifiable with lifestyle changes, you know, with um, medications and other treatments. Um, so I think it gives us a lot of hope too that this is, um, you know, one risk factor that we can potentially change unlike advancing age, you know, and other um, risk factors. Yet, um, even though uh, we're, um, you know, there's more and more recognition of the importance of um, studying like midlife, um, most studies of dementia, you know, including um, the ones, my own studies that I work on, you know, typically begin around age 60, you know, or 65. So we've done a few studies, you know, focused on, on midlife, and I actually have a new VA merit where we are, um, we are focused on that age group. Um, but again, most of our local studies, obviously we're working on um, you know, older, working with older adult populations. 
but we have collaborated with, um, with researchers from the Framingham Heart Study, and people may be familiar with that study, but it's been going on since the 1940s. Um, and it was originally uh, designed to study um, cardiovascular disease and risk for cardiovascular disease, but they've now followed three generations of participants and have a lot of data on um, cognition, uh, dementia, um, they now have MRI data. So it's just a really, really um, you know, rich data set. And then in this study, we looked at midlife vascular risk factors and how they interact with ApoE4 genotypes to affect later um, cognitive decline. So we had about 1,500 participants. Um, they were assessed originally, or well, they're followed for a long time, but for this particular um, study, um, we looked at data collected at age uh, 54 um, and looked at vascular health and uh, neuropsychological performance. And then they were assessed again at age 62, so about eight years later, and we looked at um, their cognitive performance and the change in, in cognitive performance. So this graph here is showing um, mean annual change in standard deviation units. Um, and we looked at, again, people with and without diabetes. So the no diabetes, um, that's a no DM on the left, and then the uh, um, diabetes group is on the right. And then we have the Apple E4 carriers in black and the non-E4 carriers um, in gray. So you can see in the back that black kind of um, long bar there. So th that's Apple E4 carriers with diabetes. So you can see they're having um, a lot more decline in these other groups. This was in verbal memory savings, but this was true across other um, cognitive domains, including attention um, and visual spatial abilities. So we, you know, we found midlife vascular risk and apoe interact to predict, you know, decline. And this wasn't um, true just for, you know, diabetes. Here I showed um, the graphs for diabetes, but this was true for other risk factors. So for hypertension and cardiovascular disease, we also saw effects. But we really, um, in this particular study, we saw, you know, strongest effects for diabetes. So there's a lot of evidence, you know, that diabetes um, does lead to vascular disease disease and infarcts. Um, and then there's more debate, or it's not um, you know, clear if, if diabetes would increase you know, Alzheimer's disease um, you know, pathology itself. Um, but we did want to you know, get a better understanding of you know, what the mechanism is um, you know, underlying um, those associations that I just showed you between midlife um, diabetes and APOE and later cognitive decline. So in the Framingham Heart Study, again, we did look at this. We looked at midlife blood glucose levels um, and we actually excluded people um, with actual um, full-blown diabetes. So really um, kind of almost the pre-diabetes um, kind of range we were interested in looking at. So in this um, study, we had a, we had a smaller um, subsample. So we had 94 participants, and again, they were all without diabetes. Um, they were assessed uh, in midlife at age 50, and we measured vascular health um, in, in, in cognition. And then um, they underwent autopsy at death, which was a mean age um, of 84. And uh, the neuropathologist looked at you know, AD uh, pathology and vascular pathology, and also vascular um, health. Um, proximal to death. And so this graph here is looking at um, medial temporal nerve fibrillary tangle density. Um, and we have, so the EBG is elevated blood glucose. So we have those who did not have elevated blood glucose on the left and those with elevated blood glucose um, on the right there. And again, we have the E4 carriers in black and non-E4 carriers in gray. So you can see in the, the back on the right, this taller bar, um, the E4 carriers who did have elevated blood glucose at midlife had, you know, had um, more neurofibrillary tangles in the medial temporal lobes. So again, um, you know, I think including midlife, and I think there are, you know, more studies that have begun looking at midlife too, but we know this is you know, an important time um, where we're where changes are occurring and might be a good time, a good place, you know, where we can, you know, intervene um, to prevent cognitive decline. So, uh, you know, I talked, um, you know, a bit about um, some of the, the biomarkers that we've been examining and how we're trying to you know, look at more subtle forms of um, vascular disease or mi more mild forms. Um, 
Also important to looking early, so looking at midlife. Um, and another thing um, that we've been trying to do in our lab, and a lot of this work has been you know, spearheaded by um, Kelsey Thomas and Emily Edmonds and, and Mark Bondi, is looking at um, pre mild cognitive impairment, so a subtle cognitive decline, so very early changes in cognition and how to best capture that. So you can see this graph here. Um, we have cognitive function on the y-axis and, and age on the, the x-axis there. And we have um, normal aging you know, at the top, that solid yellow line. And then you know, in the dotted line, we have objective subtle cognitive decline. Um, so occurring again before mild cognitive impairment and before um, Alzheimer's disease, dementia. And so in this, um, study, Kelsey looked at a few different um, variables, but this graph here is showing um, pet amyloid um, and over time, so pet amyloid accumulation. And we have a cognitively normal group in red um, and the objective subtle cognitive decline group in blue and the MCI group in green at the top. And so you can see the um, objective subtle cognitive decline group is really um, intermediate to the other two groups. Um, and Kelsey saw that also with um, and a renal cortical thickness and, and other variables she looked at too um, in this study and other studies she's looked at, they really do seem, you know, in terms of uh, different biomarkers to be, to be intermediate um, between um, the normal, cognitive normal group and those with mild cognitive impairment. So in terms of, you know, how to, you know, best capture or define this, um, Kelsey and Emily and others have been working on different criteria um, to, to best define subtle cognitive decline. Um, so, you know, as part of this, again, these people, um, you know, wouldn't meet the criteria for mild cognitive impairment, um, but they can have, uh, they have, you know, poor performance compared to the cognitive normal group. And it could be on, you know, neuropsychological total scores, which we often look at, um, you know, free recall scores for, for memory, um, like Boston naming, animal fluency, or trails, or your trails B. We also, um, or Kelsey's also incorporated, you know, process variables. So not only, you know, what the total um, kind of score that we conventionally um, look at when we look at, you know, mild cognitive impairment or, you know, other conditions, but the process variables are kind of how people come to that, you know, score. So it could be errors or other things that indicate um, information about how that person completed the task. So in this study, um, you know, Kelsey looked at intrusion errors, um, learning slope, um, and uh, kind of interference as people were learning. So we looked at um, some other biomarkers um, now with looking at subtle cognitive decline. Um, we looked at neurofilament light, um, which is a marker of axonal damage. And people um, who've studied this have seen that it does relate to you know, white matter changes, but it also it's, it's not a very specific marker. So it's elevated in several different neurodegenerative um, conditions and also you know, traumatic brain injury and, and, um, and other disorders. But what we did find, so we looked at um, plasma NFL, so people will measure either in CSF or, or in plasma, and it is elevated in um, subtle cognitive decline um, and MCI. So you can see here um, uh, in this graph, we have you know, NFL and the cognitive normal group in blue, the subtle cognitive decline group in green, and then our MCI group there in orange. So you can see, again, this subtle cognitive decline group is, is intermediate there. And they're actually similar to the you know, closer to the MCI group. And this was a, a paper that, um, a project that uh, Kelsey Thomas led, and this is using ADNI data again. So this is looking at um, sort of blood flow in Alzheimer's disease vulnerable regions. So um, here we looked at hippocampus, inferior parietal lobe, inferior um, temporal uh, region. And so we have a cognitively unimpaired group in blue, um, the objective cell cognitive decline group in green, and then the MCI in in purple there. Um, and so what we found was this inverted U pattern of blood flow um, across, you know, prodromal Alzheimer's disease stages. You can see that in, here in these groups, how the, the, the green, the objective cell cognitive group actually has you know, higher, higher blood flow in these regions. So we thought this was really, um, really interesting. And others have seen this um, with Stable blood flow in different risk groups, whether it's ApoE4 carriers um, or other other AD risk um, groups, where there's been this um, hyperperfusion um, in these in these um, 
these individuals. So, you know, what this means is, this, you know, these are things we're still exploring, but we thought it could reflect a neurovascular um, dysregula dysregulation. So maybe higher CBF is needed to maintain cognitive functioning in this subtle cognitive decline group relative to those with MCI, um, but could also be reflective of these kind of early cognitive inefficiencies that distinguish, you know, subtle cognitive decline um, from those with, with unimpaired um, cognition. Okay, so you know, kind of ex expanding the model, things that we're you know studying and thinking about again, vascular contributions, um, the midlife timeline, and how important that is, and also kind of looking at sensitive uh, neuropsychological measures and looking at subtle cognitive decline in that pre MCI stage. So in terms of um, kind of future directions, what we're doing now, um, and also I guess the impact of, of these different um, factors and things that, we're, that we are studying, um, of course, you know, as I've alluded to before, you know, vascular um, factors and conditions can be potentially modifiable with lifestyle changes and treatment of vascular risk factors that could have a large impact on prevention of dementia. Um, we're interested in looking at new um, biomarkers. So you know, I talked about some of our work we've done with white matter hyperintensities um, and cerebral blood flow, but we're also, of course, interested in arterial stiffening, also um, trying to assess blood brain barrier um, permeability and also looking at um, compliance or stiffening um, within the brain um, itself, the vessels within the brain. And then midlife, of, um, you know, this is, we're really interested in kind of looking across, um, you know, the lifespan from midlife, you know, to late life, um, with midlife um, being a time where we may be able to intervene earlier and prevent cognitive decline. Um, I think I alluded to before to some um, current grants, including a VA Merit Award that does focus on midlife. Um, so we have studies now, you know, that go from midlife um, to late life. So we can look across, you know, many, many years. And in terms of sensitive neuropsychological measures, um, you know, we're trying to detect people as early as we can who are at risk and also um, use more sensitive, you know, cognitive measures in the model, that first model that I showed the first slide, you know, it suggests that cognition changes, you know, quite late after, um, you know, maybe even years after, you know, biomarkers um, like amyloid are changing. And, um, you know, I think if we do have more sensitive measures also look, you know, longitudinally uh, within individuals, um, we may be able to detect that change earlier. Um, and so we're continuing to study subtle cognitive decline. Again, Kelsey Thomas and Emily Edmonds, um, you know, have really, um, Put a lot of effort into this, how to um, to determine how to best uh, define subtle cognitive decline, and we have ongoing studies, you know, various different um, biomarkers um, in decline. And I think now uh, Kelsey even is, um, you know, applying potentially applying some of these um, subtle cognitive decline criteria to on um, the ADRC uh, cohort, which is really exciting. Well, I'd like to, you know, acknowledge. Um, my various, uh, you know, mentors, colleagues, collaborators, and, um, you know, thank Dennis um, Smirnoff at the ADRC and Dr. Glasgow, Dr. Sam, and, and Christina and everyone who's been involved, um, you know, with the pulse wave velocity data collection. Um, and then of course, um, you know, research participants um, who we can do our work without and also um, funding sources. Thank you. Um, and I have my, my email here too. I've, I think we have time for questions, but also if anyone you know, would like to um, email later, if, if questions come up, you can always reach out to me. That was excellent. Thank you so much. That was a really great presentation. Thank you, Christina. I don't see any questions submitted in the chat quite yet. Um, but now would be a good time if anybody would like to just hop in with a question spontaneously, that's completely fine. Or if you would prefer to type it in and have me help narrate, I'm happy to do that. Katie, really nice presentation. Thank you very much. Um, it was a whirlwind tour of a lot of material in just 40 odd minutes. So congratulations on pulling it off. Uh, take a drink of uh, clean water. <laughs> um, so uh, if I got it right, then Adney has uh, pulse um, 
pulse pressure, and you're now collecting pulse wave velocity using carotid and femoral measures as well as distance, right? Yes. Okay, that's really interesting and cool. Yeah. So we've been, if we ever come off the, um, the pause, the pandemic pause, uh, we'll start collecting that data. So I just want to throw that out as kind of a, a shameless plug. <laughs> so maybe you guys would be interested. We should have a few thousand of people in that. Wow. Yeah, no, that would be fantastic. Um, and Christina, you should correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I think that, you know, the, the idea to is to continue with the ADRC pulse wave velocity collection. So it'll be nice, nice eventually to have longitudinal data and also be able to look at, you know, cognition, these other, you know, markers um, and even potential MRI longitudinally. So um, yeah, I think we'll have a really, really rich data set. There's already a lot of um, data collected and, you know, once participants, um, you know, start coming back, hopefully we can, you know, continue that. And I'm verifying that, yes, we built it all into our source yeah. and added right. to our database and everything. Yeah, that looks great. Because it has been, you know, it was, it was a steep learning curve, right? It was, yeah, there's a lot of training and it can be a little bit tedious, but I know, I see, think of Bailey's on here. I know there are lots of people who were um, involved in, you know, helping to get that. So thank you, yeah, to everyone for all the efforts on that. Yeah, thank you to your team too. They did a lot of work in helping to get us trained up and making sure the equipment troubleshooting was sufficient. <laughs> that was, like you said, the biggest learning curve was just yeah. trying to figure out what was going wrong with the equipment. So once you have all this nice data, um, Katie, is that um, I don't know if the uh, pathology, so people will ultimately die as we all will, um, so, um, I don't know if that's, that type of autopsy is happening here at ADRC. I think we've had a limited, uh, scope of what, you know, tissue that is being examined. And I don't know where, if that will affect you down the line. I know that's kind of a long ways off, especially since you're focused on the younger people, I think, but, um, something, uh, you know, we've talked about and, um, in the ADRC group a few times. And um, maybe this is some, another argument why we should look at different uh, areas of the brain, tissue, vessels, and what have you. But it's just a comment. Yeah, no, that would be really um, excellent. And I presented that um, one neuropath study from the ADRC um, that we published in Alzheimer's and dementia back in 2015, but I've been wanting, you know, to, yeah, to follow up with some of that data. Cause I think that's also really unique. A lot of people don't have, you know, the neuropath data and really to look at, you know, what the tissue looks like. So you know, if we could, um, you know, do more studies, um, with that, that would be, yeah, that would be excellent. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Even if we could do, I know some people do the post-mortem MRI and, you know, relate that to, um, you know, the tissue, the histopath. Yeah, so that would be great too, but <laughs> I don't know if that's possible. Hi, Katie, it's Gary. Hi, Gary. Hi. Um, I was curious about the white matter intensities, hyperintensities. Um, and um, the degree to which that's specific to Alzheimer's disease, you may have mentioned something about that, but it seems like it, it's probably uh, applicable to a lot of different kinds of pathology. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, it's not, you know, specific to Alzheimer's disease and even you know what it's made of, you know, some people it could be inflammation related to even, um, you know, tau deposition, some people argue, and ischemia. So I think there's, yeah, there's, um, you know, a lot of different contributors. Um, you know, and Adam Brickman, who he's done a lot of work on this, so I'll, you know, cite some of his work again, but, you know, at Columbia, um, you know, what he, you know, found, it was really, it was um, the one matter hyperintensity is more in the posterior distribution, so parietal lobe, even parietal and occipital lobe, I think that, yeah, you know, did seem um, that was, increased in the Diane study and other studies he looked at. So in these, you know, posterior regions, um, you know, it seems to map on to the distribution of um, cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Um, so that, you know, could relate to that. So it isn't specific, although it does seem that maybe, you know, parietal lobe and some of the, there's some, you know, regional specificity potential that, you know, re may relate more to Alzheimer's disease. And yeah, we looked at 
frontal or total or white matter hyperintensities. Mm -hmm. That could still be an important factor. Yeah. Even though it's, it's uh, yeah. to other kinds of yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, and I think a lot of people have been interested in also how um, white matter hyperintensities interacts with amyloid um, to affect cognition. And I think, you know, findings have been a little mixed, but I think there's a lot of evidence that it does, um, yeah, it, you know, it does affect the clinical picture quite a bit, so. Did you ever look at HIV and, the, and you know, I'm, I'm not sure that it, it was the, uh, white matter hyperintensities, but there was some, this, this was many years ago. And I remembered them talking about the imaging and how they would get these white matter changes. And then they would, they would change that they would disappear. And you, you referred to that happening in, in something else as yeah. well, but I don't know if you looked at the HIV. I haven't. No, I haven't. Um, yeah. It was Terry Jernigan's work, I believe at the yeah. time. <laughs> it was a while yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. When I know, um, you know, T Mark and, you know, the HNRP, they are, you know, still collecting. I think a lot of that day with Chris, you know, Fetterman Notstein, I think is doing a lot of that work now. Yeah, to look at, um, yeah, what, I know they're looking at white matter hyperintensity, and they have a really good method to do that. So they'll have to touch base with her on it because I don't know as much of the HIV literature. You know? Yeah. But that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Katie, I, first off, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, this is Div here. Uh, Hi, Div. Question for you. So a lot of the work that you presented looks at compliance of large arteries and looks at the pulse wave velocity of large arteries. Wondering if anyone has any research, how does this translate downstream? So like to the microvasculature, you know, just because a patient has a stiff aorta, does that mean that they have impaired autoregulation at the microvascular level? And I know I'm sure you're using it as a surrogate, but I'm wondering what's actually happening at the level of the microvasculature. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, so I think the stiffening, you know, and you may know, you know more about this than me with um, you know, your medical training and stuff, but begins kind of in the aortic arch and then kind of, you know, branches out. But I, you know, a lot of these conditions that we're looking, that we're looking at, like we have studies looking at type two diabetes and, you know, obviously also hypertension, um, you know, as ways to kind of, in, you know, enrich, um, you know, for vascular disease. But of course, you know, the microvasculature, you know, is very much um, affected. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I haven't seen a lot of studies looking at this exactly, but I think it would. And I think yeah, it's something that I should look at. <laughs> Katie, I have Thank a question. Um, this is Christine. Uh, in your post-pressure data, you, you mentioned that it was related to APOE status and the AD-like biomarkers. Is that right? Um, yeah. And then in later in later data that you presented, you were kind of controlling like controlling for APOE, or so you're trying to control for some of that stuff um, <clears throat> for some of the analyses. So for the post pressure stuff, um, if you were to control for APOE status, would the AD like biomarker finding still remain, and would the AD like biomarker finding remain if you controlled for APOE status? Like I imagine that those groups are kind of overlapping. Yeah, so they are, um, I'm trying to even look at my slides because I don't remember if we, because Dennis actually did those analyses. I don't know if I said, I don't think we did adjust, yeah, for APOE when we looked at the, um, the biomarker positive, yeah, and uh, pulse wave velocity interactions. Um, and yeah, that, I mean, it, the effect wasn't too strong. Um, so it could go, I mean, it could potentially go away if we adjusted for Apple before, but I don't know. So we should, I mean, we should try it, you know, looking at that. And this is something that we are going to be writing up soon. So these are helpful suggestions too, if people have, you know, other suggestions too. Um, so yeah, we should try adjusting for, for Apple before. Cause I don't, I don't know that we've done that, but which is adjusted, I think, for yeah, demographics, age, sex, education. Or couldn't it even get stronger if you control if you adjusted for that? I mean, it might like with your diabetes and APOE4 interaction, it seemed like the diabetes APOE4 group were the ones that 
every, you know, had all the bad cognitive problems. So I'm wondering if it, anyway, maybe it would clarify the results or even improve it. Yeah. Yeah. And we should um, look at that and see. Yeah. Cause I don't think we've done that again. Um, you know, Dennis was so helpful in, in running analyses, but I'm not sure that we we've actually looked at that yet. So. We're right about at time. I don't know if anybody has one last question or comment. We have about a minute left. A couple more people thanking you and letting you know you did a great job. So I will echo that sentiment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming and for the good questions and yeah, I appreciate it.